Welcome to the powerful plants of the Short Street Nature Preserve. I'm Rachel Toker, President of Urban Ecosystem Restorations. This webinar is funded by the Chesapeake Bay Trust and the City of Gaithersburg. UER also thanks our partners in this project, the Lakelands Community Association, and our landscape contractor, Greener Visions Landscaping. By way of quick background, UER is an urban land trust that creates, protects, and aggregates what we call eco-functioning spaces. Then we engage people with these spaces in ways that respect nature and allow it to thrive. Eco-functioning spaces are spaces that support ecosystem functions in order to address multiple environmental challenges systemically. They're a kind of nature-based solution to global and local problems. We're going to discuss what an ecosystem function means shortly and dig further into what eco-functioning spaces are later in the program. I did want to ask, um, has anybody taken a UER webinar already in the past with a prior for a prior session? Hey, okay. Um, okay. Today, I want to tell you about the powerhouse plant communities that will be transforming the Short Street stormwater basin into the Short Street nature preserve and play space. And I want to empower you with the knowledge and resources that you need to use your yard to create the same amazing environmental and health benefits for your family and neighborhood. To that end, we'll cover the connection between our yards and the surrounding natural environment, some basic ecosystem science and how it relates to your yards, environmental problems that we can address using our yards as nature-based solutions, why and how we did what we did at the Short Street Project. I'm gonna highlight then some of the most powerful plants that we used and where we used them. And finally, cover how you can translate the Short Street Project's principles to your yard using many of the same plants, creating beauty, solving stormwater problems, and becoming an ecosystem hero. So let's take a look at the big picture and some very basic ecosystem science. I want to start by placing us all in context. Every piece of land is part of a larger landscape and a set of differently sized ecosystems. As you think about your yard, remember that it performs certain functions on your property, specifically on your property, and it functions as part of a larger set of natural systems, all of which are interacting with each other all the time. Let's review what an ecosystem is. Ecosystems are the natural systems in which we live. They are dynamic and complex. They're defined by the functional relationships among individuals, their communities, and their non-living environment. Let me break that down. Within an ecosystem, we see movement and transformation of matter and energy, including water and nutrients across land, air, and water bodies above and below the ground surface. There are a mix of plant species that have a history of coexisting in communities together with animals that have evolved to live in those plant communities, all of which drive matter and energy through the system. And all of these species produce successive generations that interact over space and time. These interactions all contribute to the healthy function of each system itself and the larger ecosystems in which we're located. Just like our bodies, our nervous system, circulatory system, digestive system, they're all performing their own particular functions, all while interacting with each other, while working together to make our bodies work as a whole. Ecosystems create the context and circumstances that we all need to live, grow, and survive through future generations. Damaging or destroying these relationships can destroy the system entirely. 
Ecosystems as spatial units occur at different sizes and scales and are usually embedded within larger ecosystems. So as you think about your property or green spaces that you own, manage, or enjoy, remember that those spaces are performing ecological functions on their sites and they're part of larger, a larger set of natural systems all nested within each other, interacting all the time. So when you transform your yard to an eco-functioning space or what we call a healthy habitat sometimes, um, you're not only creating an ecosystem in your yard, you're contributing to the health of the larger ecosystems in which you're a part. Okay, ecosystems can be healthy or unhealthy. How do we know when, a, when an ecosystem is healthy? So here's an, a quick image of a healthy ecosystem. In a healthy ecosystem, all the subsystems are working and interacting with each other. And we know that's happening when we see certain indicators. They are biological and genetic diversity. And in this picture, you can see diverse forms of plant life. We know there are diverse forms of animal life. They're relying on that plant life, even though they're not in the picture. There's interaction diversity, meaning that we know there are many species interacting with each other, feeding off each other, using each other to reproduce and supporting each other's health. And this is where evolutionary history together really matters when we talk about native plant communities uh, and co-evolution. There's structural diversity. This is really, really important and often gets lost in our landscapes, which is that different species are occupying different niches within the space. We see vertical structure here, meaning that there are different plant species at different heights. Um, they're taking up different parts of the space um, and they're contributing to the ecosystem in this way. They're also providing refuge for different kinds of animals um, and nesting areas. Finally, uh, no, sorry, almost finally, there's a regular cycling of materials and energy through the system, which you can see here. Um, not only dynamic succession in terms of young plants and older plants, but also in terms of decomposition and returning nucle uh, nutrients into the soils. And there's generational succession, uh, which we just talked about as well, which is that you can see young and old moving through life cycle. All of this enables resilience in the face of disturbance. When you're out and about, look for these indicators as you move around your surroundings. Look for them where you see and, and, and note where you see healthy nature and where you don't in the spaces where you live, work and play. So we want our ecosystems to be healthy, but why? Uh, why is this important? Why is it relevant to you? Well, as healthy ecosystems function, they produce a wide range of ecosystem services. Uh, for this talk, I focus on what are called regulating ecosystem services, like outdoor temperature regulation and heat island mitigation, uh, air filtration or clean air, water filtration or clean water, water cycling and flood management, stormwater management, carbon absorption and sequestration, and the maintenance of food webs and pollinators, which are necessary for food production. These are essential for urban societies to operate on a daily basis. They're need to haves, not nice to haves, um, that when people try to perform them without nature's help, they're very costly and require intensive inputs of energy and resources if people can perform them at all. Many of these services, and this is really important to kind of notice, are, are hyper-local. These services often happen right at the site where the mini ecosystem or the micro ecosystem is operating, like stormwater management, like air filtration, like heat island mitigation. If you are not near or in these spaces, you are not getting the benefit of the ecosystem services, of those particular ecosystem services. Um, so just, just to recap on this section, the long established interactions of living things and system cycles drive ecosystem health. Healthy ecosystems provide essential ecosystem services that manage stormwater, provide fresh air, 
ensure working food webs, and mitigate climate change. They also help us adapt to environmental, disturbance, environmental disturbances like extreme weather. A healthy ecosystem is not just a theoretical concept. It must be addressed locally and by large numbers of people in order for cities like ours to survive and thrive. So what is, what's the problem? Why am I talking to you? Um, well, we're gonna sort of zoom in and zoom out at different scales to look at the problem and look at how we have the opportunity to address it. So to start with, we're just gonna look at city and regional levels um, and notice our traditional land covers. These are buildings, pavement, compacted soils, cultivated turf for artificial grasses and invasive species. And the predominant urban land covers today are hallmarks of ecosystem damage. Over the past 50 plus years, we have implemented these kinds of land covers for our built areas, open spaces, and public infrastructure. If we zoom in for a second, we can see what those uses actually do to the key indicators of ecosystem health. Looking at this spectrum of urban nature, we see um, from moving from the left to the right, a deterioration of biodiversity, interaction diversity, complexity, structural complexity, and the cycling of matter and energy. As we incorporate the traditional land uses, we destroy these attributes of healthy ecosystems, reducing ecosystem function and losing ecosystem services. So zooming back out to the regional level for a second, we can see that our traditional urban development is common and spreading across larger and larger swaths of land. Some people even today talk about regional aggregations of cities now into mega cities or megalopolis, a megalopolis, sort of the Baltimore, Washington um, corridor, so to speak, um, eventually sort of becoming one massive urban region. Um, and this visual, visual only shows through 2010, uh, so it's fairly old. Uh, the, this, this land pattern is progressing without question, and Maryland is not an exception. So this is ecologically devastating as urban footprints grow across the world. When we destroy the ecological systems upon which we depend, we get everything from flooding and pollution to widespread mental health and chronic disease. Uh, we all kind of know about environmental and public health problems in our region, um, but most of us are not aware of how deeply these problems are connected <clears throat> to the loss of nature where we live, work, and play. <clears throat> Sorry. <clears throat> and just to note, in addition to the displacement of natural systems for our buildings and our roads, <clears throat> We also degrade nature in our urban open spaces. So this is a spectrum of nature that I put together for um, my, my recent master's project um, for my graduation that was last May uh, from a master's of environmental management program. And we can see <clears throat> sort of on one end of the spectrum, what we might call high quality nature or healthy urban nature. Um, and then going down to the bottom of the lowest health level when it comes to looking at indicators of healthy ecosystems. <clears throat> and in the suburbs, certainly, we see a lot of low quality open space. <clears throat> so quickly, um, where we land with all of this information is that the result of our traditional development and landscaping practices, including public stormwater management practices and facilities, um, traditional practices, um, we see increased flooding from the growing disruption of native ecosystems, as well as with extreme weather. These erode and weaken our waterways, sending salts, fertilizers, and other pollutants into our streams and rivers, and devastating local plant and animal populations. 
as the cycle of degradation worsens, we lose more and more ecosystem services and our problems grow. In the city of Gaithersburg in the Lakelands community and the Kentlands community, um, this immediately impacts the Muddy Branch, which is suffering uh, and needs people to help care for it through their on-site practices. Um, so now let's turn to what we're really here for, which is solutions. Where do we go from here? Uh, we now see system breakdowns that are happening at regional, local, and site levels. Um, some of you may have experienced flooding on your own land. Uh, we know that gray stormwater management infrastructure, gray meaning the tunnels and big stormwater basins that have been constructed over the last 30 to 40 years, um, all contribute mightily to ecosystem disturbance. And we can't undo everything. We're not going to undo all of the damage that's been done. And we're not going to return the bulk of our urban areas to pre-development habitat. Uh, but we can restore key ecosystem functions that are essential to a better environment and a better quality of life. We can make lemonade out of lemons. By way of just additional background, when we're thinking about regional ecosystem health, um, regional ecosystem health requires sort of three big buckets of um, assistance, shall we say. The first is using our space for high quality ecological space. Um, second, doing it in the highest quantity possible. But third is building connections between high quality, large high quality areas. And so, um, so part of the message is, if you don't have a large space, you can still contribute through adding connectivity. That is, that is I won't say equally important, but it is extremely important, connecting large high quality um, natural spaces, it's, it's almost as important as, as preserving the, the remaining natural, uh, large natural spaces that we have. Okay. And so um, in urban neighborhoods, we need lots of people to restore urban and suburban to restore ecological function to their yards and common areas so that we can increase the size of high quality nature and build connectivity. Uh, the more individuals and neighborhoods can step up and take action on their own lands, the more we can do to return regional, regional ecosystems to health. We got into a lot of this mess one neighborhood at a time. We can get ourselves out of it that way too. Um, so one type of eco-functioning space um, that we've done a demonstration project uh, at the Lakelands already for is what's called conservation landscaping. You may have heard of it or be familiar with it. Um, and at, at base, conservation landscaping is creating, is a concerted effort to use native plant communities um, strategically positioned to address, to, to to strengthen and regenerate ecosystem health um, while frankly lowering the maintenance costs of the space and um, improving its, its interest and novelty and supporting biodiversity. And for Butterfly Commons, it's really an example of how even the smallest spaces can have huge impact. Um, so we don't want people to write off small yards and small spaces. Um, they're important when, when basically our motto is make every square foot count. Um, I do want to just put a note in that for the city of, city of Gaithersburg residents, um, the city does have a, a Rainscapes Rewards program that um, will help subsidize 
uh, conversion of turf grass uh, to conservation landscaping. We are going to be putting on a webinar with the, the folks of this from the city who run the program uh, in March. So please stay tuned for that. Um, okay. So now let's get ourselves into the Short Street Nature Preserve. Um, the original site looked pretty much like this. Um, it's a stormwater basin, stormwater management basin, traditional kind that's been hollowed out. And um, it, it collects basically uh, 1.2 acres of surrounding impervious surface water runoff that it drains into this little basin um, through tunnels. This space also collects some, surf, uh, actually a fair amount of surface runoff um, that comes into it from adjacent roads. So um, we wanted to take this space, oh, sorry, and do a couple of things. Um, we had four overarching goals for this space. First was improving the water, improving water quality and um, clean, improving clean water using nature-based solutions. Uh, basically, the city, this will help the, the city comply with its Clean Water Act mandates. Um, and it will it take it will will as it matures and grows, it will be taking all of this water that has traditionally been flooding into the basin and then immediately draining out into the muddy branch through these big drains um, and then getting dumped untreated into the muddy branch river. We wanted to create an eco functioning space that was going to retain and infiltrate the water. Uh, in order to do that, the soils um, need to be substantially improved because they are compacted. Um, we wanted to take a systems approach that addresses not only stormwater, but climate change resilience, heat island effects, and biodiversity loss. We wanted to combine ecological health with the health benefits of nature play um, for kids and those who are kids at heart. Um, which and nature play, we have other webinars where, where we talk about what nature play is and why it's so important. But what's important for this webinar is that it's normally active play. And really what's important is that it, it gives kids or, or adults an experience of being immersed in nature. Basically, there, there's a feeling that it's not just a tree at a stoplight or I mean, at a stop sign, and it's not just a a uh, shrub that's on the side of the road, but a feeling that this is a place of nature where um, you can be in it, be in nature. Um, and we also wanted to improve safety because uh, children were playing in this space uh, and tended to play around the riprap, which is part of the traditional stormwater management practices uh, practice. Uh, the riprap being those huge piles of stone you, you, have, you would have seen in the picture. Uh, we also wanted to use it to build community cohesion and environmental literacy through art and play, and then show people, most importantly <laughs> for this webinar, show people how to use their own yards and common areas to do this um, and replicate it. And, and finally, we also wanted to create a space that was as low maintenance as possible over time, both in terms of effort and cost. but we had constraints. As noted, we can't undo the modified conditions and stormwater management system infrastructure that's there. Um, we can only change uh, what's on the surface and, and the, the soils. Um, we can't change the shape or the size or the um, depth of the, the, the grade and depth of the, the slopes and the basin. We can't put this back to a natural state. We can't negatively affect the stormwater management uh, uh, infrastructure and the tunnels. And so, and we have a limited budget and we wanted to make sure it was safe. And we wanted to make sure that it could accommodate active nature play 
and uh, withstand deer and rabbit pressure. So we had a lot, a lot of things that we're, we're trying to manage and deal with. And we wanted to create a landscape that would ultimately be self-regenerating. Um, okay, so we need nature's help to do this. And so just to quickly look at um, how we started uh, and, and what, how we started and how we wanted to approach this project. Um, so for safety, per so, so just to orient people, um, this is, so, so the stormwater basin sits in a triangle uh, between these three roads, uh, Still Creek Lane, Turtle Pond Lane, and Short Street. Um, the tunnels are coming in through these green spaces and sending large amounts of water down into the depth, the depth, the depth of this space, sorry, is down on this side, if you can see my cursor, uh, and the drains are over here. So we wanted to pull the nature play up to where it was drier and there wasn't huge amounts of stormwater infrastructure or um, huge in, influx, influxes of water. And then, uh, and away from the riprap. And then we wanted to, and I'm gonna show you a few other diagrams. And then we wanted to keep this as, as densely planted, this the wettest parts as possible and stabilize the slopes of this space. Now, hopefully for most of you, your yards will not be this complicated. Uh, now this just uh, to show you on site, this is this bubble is where we wanted to put the nature play basically move it up away from this is this is the rip wrap here. And in this corner, it's a slightly different orientation. Well, it's it, it's it's this picture would be over here. Uh, these are the drains that take the water out quickly so that the water doesn't sit. That also means it doesn't have a chance to infiltrate, uh, which is fine in traditional stormwater management setting. But for our purposes, that's not that's not how we want to go. Um, and this is actually a picture from upslope. This is Still Creek Lane, where we have a lot of water running in um, from off the street. And it's also where a lot of kids will enter down into the riprap. So as we're going to see, we put a lot of trees and bushes in this space, as well as some really tough uh tough water resistant, uh, I mean, not water resistant, <laughs> um, tough, tough, uh, grabby uh, grasses, native grasses that are gonna stay in here. So we'll, we'll go into that in just a second. Okay, um, so, and here's here's another picture, uh, both with, with and without color that show the nature play area is up here in this nestled into this sort of the top of this triangle. And then we've got a, a running path or a walking path that, that connects the nature play through what's called the wet meadow. Um, we also preserved some space for sledding, which was highly prized by the neighborhood. Um, and so the bulk of our plantings are gonna be, or well are, uh, along these slopes, uh, the slope along Turtle Pond, the slope along Still Creek, Creek, and the slope along Short Street, and then a ton of plantings in what we're calling the wet meadow. Um, and and here's, here's the color of the wet meadow. This is where these big pipes are draining out tons of water, and we're capturing it before it can get to the two drains. Okay. Uh, so, so just in terms of approach and what you might want to think about, we, we, we wanted to look at first, what is, what is this ecosystem missing in terms of uh, the drivers of health? In this case, it was missing tremendous amounts of structure, structural complexity. Um, where there were trees, there were no understory or, or, or bushes, perennials, or ground cover other than grass. And, um, uh, and the slopes also were just basically covered with grass with a few sparse trees. So um, 
we also, because of the way this, this project is, I mean, the way that this basin was manufactured, um, it was hollowed out with steep slopes um, and compacted soils. So what we, so what we have is, is um, basically dry slopes um, that are subject to erosion. We have wet meadows is what we characterize the really wet parts. Um, and then we're sort of missing a whole level of understory um, trees and bushes. And so that's how we, um, that's how we basically divided up the space in terms of microclimates. And then we started to think about uh, what kinds of plants and plant communities could tolerate the microclimates and the uses that we need to, to put into the space. Um, so let me just scroll down and share this quickly. And so again, uh, we had, th th this drawing is not exactly to scale. Um, what, what tends to happen is that the water flow, tremendous amounts of water flow, um, not only around the tunnels, but into the space in between this pathway. And so the idea here was we would create this massive um, soak, soak up, uh, you know, perennial soak, and we'd have a pathway that runs through it so people could walk through and experiencing it and, and, and experience it without walking on the plants because these, this mix of perennials is not really um, amenable to a lot of running, uh, trampling. Having said that, at the upper space where there is gonna be a lot of running and trampling, um, we have a mix of sort of tough as nails uh, uh, grasses, some some bushes we have more mulch um, that's so so it's less planted that's partly for regulatory reasons too and permitting um, and we also have have um, well I'm going to get to them the native grasses that can really tolerate some um, abuse and then we've got some other perennials that can not only tolerate a abuse, but they're going to die back in the winter so that um, when people want to sled and uh, sort of run as opposed to maybe, uh, you know, swing and jump and climb and what we have or run around the path, um, those plants are not going to have trouble managing that use uh, during late fall through early spring. Um, so the dieback is actually a major benefit in some respects. And we can decorate the space in other ways. Um, that's just a note toward, you know, people who are looking for constantly evergreen uh, plants and don't love native plants that die back. There, there actually are some real benefits to the dieback, um, especially in places that have active use. Uh, so wait. So let me, what I want to do for one second I'm going to go into this. I'm going to turn to the specific plants that we used, um, why we use them, and how they kind of pl play nicely together. That you know, again, I, I don't know if I emphasized it clearly, but plants, for those of you who maybe aren't gardeners, a lot of them have personalities um, or they have predispositions, <laughs> and some are rough and tumble, and some are aggressive, and whether being a, an aggressive plant is, now I'm not talking about invasives, I just wanna be perfectly clear and I wanna make sure people understand there's a difference between alien, uh, not alien or non-native invasive plants, which are beyond aggressive. They're actually colonizing and they damage ecosystems. Um, and we'll be doing a webinar about you sort of in base, top invasives of concern in Montgomery County. Um, and there are some natives that will be very aggressive, but they're not invasive in that way, um, but they can be pushy. So, and we're gonna talk about some of them. Now, whether something's aggressive or confident <laughs> um, really depends on what you want out of it. And so there's some very aggressive plants that are so important for degraded spaces 
because they hang on and they're tough as nails and they spread. And we're going to talk about a couple of them, some of them being the black eye, uh, black eyed Susan um, from the Rudbeckia family. So before I go into the very the specific plants that we chose and sort of their amazing benefits, I do want to pause for one second and just see if there are any questions so far on either big picture or kind of what we were trying to accomplish at Short Street. And I don't know, you can either put it in the chat or if it's the, the Kentlands group, um, if you want to unmute. Uh, looks like Jam, you have a question? Yeah, who actually owns this property? Did you have to get some group permission or? Yes, you know? so, so the Lakelands community, so this is a common area of the Lakelands community and the Lakelands Community Association owns it and manages it. And so and they contracted with y'all to get the project under, under management or? Well, in a, uh, in a sense, you it's UER has the the, the city funding, um, and we run the project, and then we contracted with them <laughs> to get to get okay. their cooperation. But yes, it's a um, and and as a as our responsibility as a land trust, we have agreements with the LCA to maintain this space for a minimum of ten years, so oh. that it can establish. Um, and sort of grow into its fullest potential. And hopefully it will continue on beyond 10 years. So any other questions? Okay, well, let's dive in. And I will just- Hi, this is Janet here at the Kentlands Clubhouse. I was at your opening party for this part that you did. Congratulations, it's marvelous. I'm glad you're still pursuing and, and have ruined your confidence from that to keep going. Um, you've been talking about individual houses. Just as an example that I might apply to my house in the Ketlands part of the area, um, do, some, do some of the homeowners now apply some of these principles to their yard? What have you? What how you expand right in that immediate neighborhood? So that's sort of our next step um, is to, I, I happen to know, have noticed actually a full yard conversion down the street from this. I don't know if we can take credit for it because um, I don't know the, I don't know personally the owner who has done that. Um, is Lisa Whitehead on today? Um, uh, no, she was invited. I don't think she's on. Okay. Um, she heads up the uh, the Environmental Beautification Committee of the LCA of the Lakelands Board, and she has has a little mm -hmm. bit more of her ear to the ground on sort of who is picking up these principles. But part of what we're trying to do now is really show people how they can take these principles into their own yards. And we, we are very much hoping that people will come forward and tell us if they are um, as a result of the Short Street Project or the Butterfly Commons Project. Um, you know, Short Street in some ways is unique and unusual compared to your standard yard, especially with the steep slopes um, and the, 1.2 acres of impervious surface runoff flowing into it. Um, but there are many aspects of it that are applicable to yards. And, and part of what we're trying to do is give you plant pallets um, or you know, give, give you examples of the kinds of plants, which we're going to talk about right now, that might fill in gaps in your own yards. Um, but I am hoping I am very much hoping that more people will take up these practices and a sneak peek preview. Um, we are gonna have an individualized coaching program. Um, it's gonna be a small cohort because the, the budget is very small for it, but I'll talk about that at the end. So, well, Thank why you. don't I? Hmm? Thank you. Yeah, you're welcome. Um, so why don't I dive back in? Okay, you can see. You're right, you can still see the slide. Good. Um, okay. 
Okay. So as I mentioned, one of the biggest things missing from this space was vertical structure and understory trees. Um, because we were lucky enough to have existing trees and some existing canopy trees, uh, we really only needed, for, for the time being, the goal was to fill in with understory trees, mostly on the slopes. That would help stabilize the slopes and also um, not disturb the root systems of the existing trees. Uh, and just basically the, the ability to place these trees with enough space for them to grow um, led us to put most of them around the slopes. And the two that you may well be familiar with, um, but they are, you know, and, and I used to think, oh, come on, it's just a dogwood. <laughs> um, hopefully people like the dogwoods and the red buds, but they are really powerful plants. Um, they, uh, uh, let me just get here. Okay. The flowering dogwood supports many species of migrating and resident birds, including thrushes, the northern flicker, the pileated woodpecker, the summer tanager, as well as many small man mammals. This tree is the host plant for the spring azure butterfly, and it supports four pollinating bee species and 118 caterpillar species. This plant is considered high value to wildlife by Maryland Department of Natural Resources. And I'll, I'll just say, I know that dogwoods tend to be reasonably common. They are, they're more well known than um, some of the other plants that we're gonna talk about and, and use. But if we could replace every crepe myrtle in Montgomery County, which is not native, with a dogwood or a redbud, we would, we would catapult ourselves um, forward in terms of biodiversity support. Uh, and so redbuds too are amazingly high value for nature. And the, the reason why I talk about caterpillars, not, not everybody um, kind of realizes that when we're looking at food webs, meaning, you know, how, how do we get uh, from plants to our own food sources, the early what's called trophs of the food web, which are the bugs and um, the birds and particularly caterpillars, that, that, that's the caterpillars are some of the most important food sources for most birds. Um, it's not seeds and berries. And so, um, you know, I, I, I defer to Doug Tallamy, who hopefully many of you have already heard of. He is much more um, articulate on the topic than I am about this issue, but it really is important when you're looking at plants and biodiversity support to take note of how many, um, how many caterpillars do they support and, and what other kinds of animals um, is when you pick your tree out, how many other species is that tree going to be able to support? And sometimes it's not even food, sometimes it's refuge and shelter. And that's- so, Go ahead. Uh oh, there she is, okay. Was there a question? Oh, okay. Um, if no, if it's not a question, then please, I welcome you to, to mute your um, channel just so just so I know who's asking questions. Um, so so those are the two main trees. They're very hardy and they could handle our very difficult um, difficult situation. Now for the bushes, and the other thing that we were trying to be mindful of, you'll see tremendous amounts of, of diversity across the perennial species that we used. Um, the trees and the bushes, we try to uh, minimize diversity so that future landscaping, so, so that we could help people understand how to ID these, these, um, these words, baby doll. These spaces. Um, sorry, I think somebody's not on mute. If you just want to check. Um, Okay, great. Thank you. So appreciate it. Okay, so the bushes that we used um, 
are Virginia sweet spire, the black elderberry, sweet pepper bush, and the winterther viburnum. Um, and let me tell you a little bit about them. We, we place them, as I mentioned also, mostly on the, in fact, I think entirely on the slopes. These are tough bushes that can handle a lot of variability in terms of sunlight, water, and heat. Um, so we also put the bushes in a lot of places we didn't want to be entry points so that we could open up specific entry points and sort of close out other, other parts of the space. We didn't want people to come in. Um, so the Virginia Sweet Spire is most comfortable in wetlands and swamps. So it's, it likes to be wet, but it's also good, fine in a wide range of soils and conditions. It's considered high, a high value food source for birds like the American Robin, the Cedar Waxwing, the Gray Catbird, and the Eastern Bluebird. It can be propagated by cuttings or seeds, and it spreads by underground runners as well. And, and, and I'll just highlight this point, which is, um, it's important to think about how the plants spread when you're thinking about your yard, because there are some that are active spreaders, uh, particularly some of the perennials we use like the Pacara, which I'm gonna talk about in a second. And that is really wonderful when you don't necessarily have the money or, or the desire to put in a lot, of, a lot of plants for one reason or another, but you want the space to fill in. Um, Again, not invasive, um, like English ivy, which is an invasive, or um, the vincas vines, which are invasive. Um, so let me just see if we've got another bush in here. OK. OK, so the Virginia sweet spire, the black elderberry, again, sweet pe pepper bush, all of these are considered both highly versatile, extremely hardy, and high value for nature. And that's the kind of stacking we want to do. It's not that hard. It just takes a mindful approach to plant selection and how the plants are likely to interact with the other plants right around them. Um, and these are friendly but hardy bushes. We also planted the bushes in spaces where we need them to grow and spread uh, because we didn't have the budget to plant as densely as we might have wanted to plant. Um, okay. Rachel, the, mm -hmm. if I went to my local nursery, would I be able to find any or all of these on their lot or how, does, how do you get them? So, so it depends on the nursery. And we and UER has a resource list that we've put together. It's on our website, but I'm also going to send it to everybody who signed up with a list of nurseries um, and their sort of approach and orientation to native plants so that you can align of your values with their values. Um, these are fair for, for native plant nurseries. These are not unusual plants to find. These, these are, um, you know, for the same reasons that we use them and that they're tough, they're versatile, and they're great for stormwater and biodiversity. A lot of, um, a lot of installers, uh, including sort of public entities, will use these. And so um, they're not hard to find if, if you know where to go. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> okay. um, which we are here to help you do. So let's talk about the perennials, which there are a ton of, and I'm not gonna go through all of them, um, but I am happy to share the plant lists with, with anyone. Um, and, and these slides will also send out, and of course this video will be available. Um, but so for the wet meadows, and, and part of what, what happened with us on this site, which may not be the case for individual yards is that, it's, it's just a very tough site and we're not 100% sure which plants are going to work, are going to thrive, um, which perennials in particular are going to thrive in these conditions. So we tried a, a, a fairly diverse mix with some known power hitters. Um, 
And so in this, in this, you can see a range of the plants that we planted for the wet, the wettest areas. Um, they tend to be, most of them are pollinator supporters, uh, not all, because some of them are tougher on uh, water absorption and soil manage, soil uh, stabilization. So uh, anyway, I'm gonna feature the black-eyed Susan. Let me just get to him. We're gonna talk about the whitewood aster, um, Lobelia, Pacara, black-eyed Susan, uh, and the Rudbeckia family. So, so there's, there are black-eyed Susans, there are brown-eyed Susans, there are coneflowers um, that are all sort of part of the same family and they have slightly different personalities, but they're all fairly, fairly beautiful and, and fairly tough. Um, the whitewood aster, eh, let me see, here we go, is a, is a spreader. So again, this is, this is part of what I'm talking about. We, we had to put in tough and aggressive spreaders. Um, this is one of them that are great by, for biodiversity support. Um, the lobelia though is a mix, it, we, we mixed um, because it's also wonderful for biodiversity support. It is not a super aggressive spreader. It is great in wet zones. Um, it's beautiful, but it's not, it's not likely to be overtaken by uh, the other pushier plants. These support hummingbirds, um, bees and butterflies. They're also reasonably versatile. So they don't have to go in a super wet space as long as you're not putting them in some kind of all sun dry um, patch. Okay. Um, this uh, Pacara, golden ragwort is one of my all time favorite plants. It is just so tough. Now this, this plant though, and when you think about vertical structure, so the asters are likely to come up two to three feet, right? So you've got, you've got your, your canopy, your understory trees, then you've got your bushes that'll range in height. And then you've got perennials that are gonna range in height from a couple of feet tall down to really what's more ground cover. The, the pacara is really more ground cover, um, but, it spreads around the taller plants and it's gorgeous in the spring with these beautiful yellow flowers, but, but it is just so tough. It can handle a lot of trampling. I was amazed. I, we worked on a very, very small landscape at an urban street corner, which has been deeply abused um, because we were not able to protect it uh, in the right of way. And we planted a bunch of pakara that's been mowed over now probably four times or was four or five times within three or four months, which really is not <laughs> how one would normally care for a pakara. And that thing that it just keeps coming back. It's not flowering, but it's not it it they, they can't kill it. Um and yet it's not invasive. And so now it can, to, to the untrained eye, it can look like a very bad invasive plant, which is called lesser celandine. Um, so it's really important not to mix it up uh, with any other plant, but it's, uh, it's just a lovely, uh, it's a lovely plant and it supports, uh, it also supports uh, many diverse species. Okay, so just quickly, cause we're long, we're, we're getting a little tight on time. The slopes, I just want to emphasize, so the slopes are very different than the wet meadow. The slopes may experience water, but it's really going to be fast runoff. There is more sunlight on the slopes. Um, we needed soil uh, uh, stabilizers, and um, we needed something that could tolerate dryness, especially in the summer. And so we got a lot, there are a lot of native grasses that are going into the slopes, um, hardy in a range of difficult conditions, a variety of different kinds of carex um, and sedge. And um, I'm happy to go into more detail about, about the grasses uh, if, we have, if we have time and people are interested. Um, and then last, just to say that because of budget, we filled in a lot of space in the wet meadow with seeds um, that we're going to see how they do. And we used uh, all 
sort of wild pollinator native mix, um, which is, is going to include purple comb flowers, uh, Rudbeckia herta, the um, landslave coreopsis, and the butterfly milkweed. And we're hoping that those are going to grow and thrive and bring in just tons of wildlife um, into the space. So when kids are playing there, they get to see all kinds of, of life as opposed to just sort of a, a dead lawn. Um, sorry, this one, um, this is, this, the hirta, the rubriki hirta is supposed to be the most aggressive. It's one of, it's, it's in the seed pack. We also have a different rudbeckia going in as plugs that is tougher, but spreads less. Um, anyway, let me just close out here um, and we can take some questions, but just to, just to wrap up on the methodology. So, so to recap on when you're thinking about the principles for your yard, you want to look at what does this micro ecosystem need to be healthy? What are the health indicators are absent? What's the microclimate I need to solve for here? Looking at your soil type, your amount of sunlight, the slope, uh, moisture in the soil, and user treatment, <laughs> likely user treatment <laughs> of, of the space. Um, you want to pick plant communities that will fulfill both criteria and work together effectively so that there aren't certain personalities that just push out others, then you're wasting money on um, plants that are just gonna get overtaken by other plants. Um, and then uh, use the Short Street palette as a resource and a guide. Uh, so, sorry. Let's just, um, sorry, this was a little out of order. So for the major takeaways, I just want everyone to, to really walk away understanding that your yard or common space definitely affects the ecosystem in which you're living. You can use it to strengthen that ecosystem or not. That's your choice. Um, ecosystem health requires biological, structural, and interaction diversity. Healthy ecosystems deliver essential ecosystem services, and you can strengthen your local ecosystem while improving your family's health and having fun using your yard, using nature-based solutions and eco-functioning spaces. Pick your plant when you pick your plant communities wisely. There are native plants that can create eco-functioning spaces in every yard and every situation. And UER is here to help you do it. Um, there are some other resources that I'll, I'll share that are included in the slides, sorry. Um, but I will, I will stop here at major takeaways and open up for any questions or comments. And I'm sure some of you probably know more than I do about some of these plant species and you are welcome to share uh, what you know or your experience, how they worked in your yard. Um, We've got, we've got at least say, let's say five minutes left to um, for people to 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 speak and and share their knowledge. Ruth, hi, um, I'm the Market Street Condo Association vice president, and um, you know we're definitely trying to be eco friendly, both from a stormwater perspective as well as plants, and we've had uh, invasion of some bugs on our plants that are impossible to get rid of and. I met with a master gardener and they mentioned um, that, you know, it's because we, they're not local plants, you know, and they're feeding off of each other. Um, and they did refer me to um, this effort uh, that you guys were doing with the Lakeland. So I was wondering who I can talk to specifically because we do, um, there's areas in the back of our units that we want to put pavers. And I think there are pavers that allow absorption as opposed to ones that um, don't. So we want to make sure we do the right thing. And um, if, uh, you know, I'm just trying to figure out who would be the best contact to go well, forward with this, because mm -hmm. it's been in the process for a while, but it's not getting anywhere. So I just need to try and <laughs> expedite it. Well, one thing, um, I, why don't you and I talk offline? Um, okay. you know, one thing UER tries to help people with is sort of um, 
your decision matrix. So, so first starting out with what do you need to solve for? And then, then what kinds of help do you actually need to solve for those issues? Um, you know, if you're looking at permeable pavers and, uh, or permeable pavement or whatever, that's, um, that will require some expertise that might be different than if you just sort of wanted to replant a garden. So um, um, I'd be happy to talk to you separately or- um, Okay. If, yeah. So yeah. should I just respond to the email and send you an email with my contact info? Just email okay. me and we'll set up a time. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. Great. Thank you. Uh, anyone else have questions or, you know, and any any thoughts on the 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 talk or things that maybe didn't make sense or um, you know anything at all? I'm I'm open to questions, feedback, comments. Hi, Rachel. I'm here at the clubhouse, Petlands. You mentioned Lisa Whitehead. She's with Lakeland. Is there an equivalent for her in Kentland? That is not, I, I, I don't know the answer to that question. Um, we, uh, UER would love to be working more closely with the Kentlands community. Um, right now, we're, we're sort of not working directly together. So I don't know the people on your board or your, your landscaping committees. Okay. And um, City of Gathers versus Rape Tapes Rewards. Who's the contact for that? For Rainscapes Rewards, um, there's a first of all, there's a web a web page um, on there, and as far as I know, right now, Michael Michael Wayand is is the person who's going to be presenting. Um, I believe he's your contact person as well. Uh, but if you go to the Gaithersburg Rainscapes page, which is not as mm -hmm. it's uh, yeah, you have to sort of look for it. <laughs> um, there should be an email to send in an inquiry to. All right, I'll try it out. Thank you. Please note that the city of Gaithersburg Rainscapes program is different from the Montgomery County Rainscapes program. Uh, the city has a separate a sort of permitting structure, and so they have a separate programming. Um, the Montgomery County is has very robust online resources, and it's worth checking them out, even if you're a Gaithersburg resident, but don't, don't, don't be sort of fooled. You, you won't be able to apply to the Montgomery County Rainscapes program for money. Thank you. Um, well, if there are no other questions, I would like to thank everyone again Again for attending. I so appreciate your time. Um, please, uh, if you enjoyed the webinar, please let me know, but also please tell your friends. Um, this is going to be posted on our YouTube channel. Uh, uh, there will be many, many more webinars coming up over the next four months. Um, if you haven't signed up for UER's newsletter, please do. That's where we that's the first place we put the information about our webinars is into our newsletter. Um, and uh, we won't we won't sort of harass you by email <laughs> like some organizations do. So um, we welcome people to sign up and learn more about our organization. So thank you all so much. Feel free to email me with follow up questions or comments. And I wish you a great rest of the day. Thanks for your time. Thank you. Okay.